thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, um, thank you also, uh, Bart, for, for inviting us and for giving us the possibility um, to speak here. Uh, you said in the beginning you don't know the relationship between EA and uh, European Commission, uh, so I probably start better with that. Uh, the European um, Environmental Agency, from the Environmental Agency to the European Environmental Agency, Alistair, um, is the uh, um, body and the agency for the European Commission. So we are not the European Commission, we are an agency in supporting uh, the work there. Um, so we see ourselves as an information broker and an ambassador between the Commission and the Member States. Um, and uh, we wanted to organize our, what we are doing here and what we pulled together uh, in this session uh, is more on the, on the EA side. So we have uh, the European Commission colleagues, unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, but Marianne Wenning, uh, the director, director from the... Um, the Environment Directorate, Quality of Life and Water, uh, where the main unit for the Water Framework Directive is um, uh, sitting. Uh, she is here for the dinner and uh, on Wednesday morning and will then um, really take care and um, uh, introduce the uh, EC part of it, of it. And we are working very closely together. So what I tell you here now uh, is, of course, an outcome of the close cooperation we are having with the uh, <coughs> colleagues uh, in Brussels. So as I say, EA as an ambassador between the Commission and the member states, uh, we always try to bring and focus on the legislative work, not only for the EU 28, but uh, as you might know, the EEA has five more member countries, uh, including also Turkey, Iceland, uh, Norway, and uh, Swiss, uh, Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Uh, but we are also working with the West Balkan countries and uh, at the uh, neighborhood uh, countries, with the neighborhood countries, really to uh, enlarge the idea of the European Union with its um, uh, legislation uh, towards accession countries, towards uh, neighborhood countries. Um, so I think there's really a, um, a notion of uh, bringing the good things as an example out, uh, of course learning of the difficult and bad things and maybe make it even better uh, for the future accession countries and uh, for a future wider EU. In that sense, I would see very much the Water Framework Directive we are talking about now as an example. So it is not so much about focusing really on, on the legal act and on the implementation, but I would now here like to focus very much on the principles and what it brings uh, to the improvement of the environment, because in the end the legislation is not and should not be about uh, the infringement and about the reporting and about the implementation for its own sake, but it should be for the improvement of the environment. And this is something we should never forget throughout that session, throughout all our work uh, with the directive. Um, so talk so much about um, this really, I think, amazing and very new piece of legislation. And what it makes it new is um, what it's called the coordinated objective, but it is really very much about the ecosystem approach, about going uh, beyond just the chemical uh, objectives and the chemical concentrations and seeing the ecological status of a river as the one objective uh, we want to achieve. Um, and that includes the biology in it, it includes uh, the hydromorphological status, and I think it is the first uh, water legislation that really looks into the hydromorphology and looks into a structure and uh, as the river as a habitat for the ecology, for the biological elements. And I say biological elements because it is not really into biodiversity. Yeah? There we have another um, uh, legislation again. I say something more about that. It also has a catchment approach, which uh, is very important when it comes to transboundary uh, management and transboundary coordination of river issues, because uh, water doesn't know any boundaries. So we really have to organize it and coordinate it across our boundaries. And I think the presentations we had today, this morning, uh, very much showed that already. Um, it is an integrated approach because uh, water legislation and the uh, water authorities 
environmental legislation does not have all the measures in hand. It is about agriculture, it is about hydropower, it is about energy, it is about navigation. This is where we have to introduce the measures, but this is often not in the hands of the environmental authorities. And we have introduced uh, something like the public participation, uh, which I think is an enormous useful tool to bring that coordination and that stakeholder dialogue uh, into life. Um, and um, with that presentation at the sideline, uh, I would also like to introduce to you a report we uh, launched last week on public participation. Um, I'll say something more about that later in my presentation. So the ecosystem approach and the river basin management, I think, with the Water Framework Directive really brought us from pure pollution control, from flood control, with the older directives in the um, 80s and 90s, brought us to something uh, we call now uh, the natural capital. And um, I think you might know this Bus, I would nearly say a new buzzword, natural capital, but what it encompasses actually is an ecosystem assessment and the approach of ecosystem, ecosystems and the ecosystem services, uh, where I think it is very vital to understand ecosystem services and the services an ecosystem provides to our society, not just as fisheries, and food, but really understand it as a regulatory services uh, the ecosystem provides to uh, help us to have a sustainable, long-term sustainable environment. So natural water retention measures, uh, flood plain restoration is very much in that realm of uh, ecosystem services and regulatory services. Um, so to go back to the actual Water Framework Directive and the results, uh, we have uh, at the EEA in 2012, uh, when the results from, from the 2010, the first river basin management plan uh, were out, uh, we made this status assessment, and you have seen that map probably before. Uh, as Alistair just said, uh, we are by far not there, and there are, um, in most areas of Europe, over 50% of the water bodies that are only in moderate to bait bad ecological status or potential. So we really have to reach the achievements of the Water Framework Directive. We have uh, quite a way to go. Um, and uh, as if the pure achievement of the Water Framework Directive are not enough, we also have the um, assessment of the last reporting now there is a new one on the way, uh, but the uh, assessment in 2012 only showed that only 15% of the uh, rivers and lake habitat types and 13% of the inland water species are in favorable conser conservation status under the bird and habitat directive. Um, so what we tried in our assessment, and you have a report of that 2012 thing outside as well, is really to relate uh, the results under the uh, nature directives with the water framework directive, and there are different kind of animals, yeah? and you, you cannot really compare uh, the, um, the um, results on the European level, but it shows something uh, to bring really uh, the ecological assessment and the notion of the water framework directive um, into the biodiversity um, arena. Um, and we have the 2020 biodiversity strategy, as you might know, which is uh, in one of its targets uh, about establishing green infrastructure and restoring at least 15% of degraded, degraded ecosystems. And of course, the important thing in the policy process right now is to think about what does it actually mean for the implementation of the Water Framework Directive and the achievements of the Water Framework Directive objectives. And this 15% should be reached by implementation of the Water Framework Directive, even though we have uh, um, two different and two policy processes here which need uh, a closer relationship to each other. And uh, this is actually underway. 
I say something about that in a moment. Uh, but let us just go for one moment to look into what are actually the main challenges uh, for Europe's water and what would be pressures, measures uh, to cope with it. So that's nothing new. Yeah? It's overuse of fertilizers, diffuse pollution uh, of surface and groundwater. It is water used for irrigation. It's drainage and effects of small water bodies and wetlands. Uh, and we have, uh, on the hydromorphological uh, side, we have barriers, transfer structures, changes for water abstraction, flow, water level regulation, dredging for navigation, and abstraction, for example, for, for gravel. We then have all the climate change elements, uh, which actually challenges the water quantity and the water quality. We have also the, the aspect of warmer waters. Uh, so it's on the scarcity and is on the, on the flood side. Uh, droughts, as we heard also from the uh, Global Water Partnership, um, droughts are really increasingly uh, forcing the equitable resource allocation. This is also a case in Europe. We heard a lot of uh, examples uh, uh, on the global side, but this is also um, uh, vital, in particular in the Mediterranean area. And also in the southern of UK, we have uh, some cases there, so it's not um, uh, only restricted to the usual uh, hot areas. So then, of course, we have the flood risks, uh, which require rethinking really in land management and not just in higher dikes. All that together uh, is a systemic challenge that uh, requires integrated advanced policy solutions. So we cannot go anymore uh, with the old directives, uh, um, wastewater, drinking water directive, with a, with a uh, one, one source, one solution, uh, linear approach uh, of um, uh, a cause and impact relationships, but we really have to look into the network and have to look how the ecosystem in in, in its network character uh, reacts to the uh, multi, um, multifunctional challenges it is exposed to. Um, and talking about network, um, like the ecosystem in a multi-impact, uh, multi-source uh, relationship uh, is connected, so is a society. And you can answer these systemic challenges only by a network approach uh, to talk to the different uh, stakeholders and the um, drivers that are represented uh, by the different stakeholders on the river basin level. Um, that brings me actually to the tools we have available to um, handle um, these challenges. And uh, I think my presentation is, is uh, headlined with pressures and measures, so I should say something about the measures as well. Um, the Water Framework Directive, and, and I thought about that when Bruno spoke. Um, I think we should see the Water Framework Directive, or I would like to see it not only as just another directive, but as a possibility and as a potential to provide a kind of umbrella to pool water measures also from other uh, policy processes. I think that is the Water Framework Directive and the blueprint that continues it actually um, gives hopefully this kind of potential. And we talked about the first rural basin management plan cycle um, started in 2004 already and now uh, towards 2009, uh, the first rural based management plans were, were published. And we are now already in the second cycle uh, where the implementation of the program of measures um, is in the center and is um, in the focus of the, of the implementation on member state level. Uh, and of course, we are looking now towards next year. Um, are we uh, going to achieve the, uh, the uh, objectives of the directive? And uh, we will not. So the map I just showed uh, on the good ecological status will probably not look much different. We hope a little bit better. But uh, we will still, in many areas, uh, not have achieved uh, the full part. Um, and I think we have a window of opportunity now in that implementation of measures to really see how we can bring that 
um, to the practical implementation. And I very much liked and noticed, again, Bruno's bottleneck. Yeah? You've, you remember the slide with listing the uh, directives and then saying, OK, how do we bring that on the ground? And I think this is really uh, one of the key questions uh, we should think about. And uh, I hope we go a little bit more in detail um, in the further session, uh, because we are having a third cycle, and many river basins are saying very clearly, we won't achieve the objectives in 2015, give us until 2021, maybe even um, uh, six years longer, uh, to, to solve out our issues. And in this process, there is a chance really, uh, to bring restoration, to bring nature aspects, to bring that integration uh, of the different stakeholders and different interests uh, really on the ground. Talking about pressures and measures, so I think that is, that is common knowledge in a, in a room like that here, what the pressures are with pollution, uh, wastewater from diffuse sources, water storage and abstraction barriers, dams, spheres, uh, bank enforcement, canalization, and uh, straightening. Um, the measures we are discussing and we are seeing in uh, many of the uh, river based management plans, in the first ones and now in the draft second ones, is about good agricultural practice. How do we implement that and how do we um, fix it and bring it to work at the right level? local level, close to the river. Uh, reduced emissions to water bodies by better wastewater treatment. I think we have still a good success story with the um, wastewater treatment directive, uh, which I think brought really over the last 30 years, 40 years, a huge improvement in chemical quality, even though that is just one part of the improvement and there's much more uh, to be done. For example, in the improvement of hydromorpholo hydromorphological uh, aspects um, with restoration, uh, changed land use, uh, removing migratory obstacles and uh, transverse structures. So this is really where the river restoration part, uh, I think, comes in. Um, we also have something like good environmental flows, which is about the hydrological management. So how do I manage a dam, actually, and how much does it flush through uh, behind the dam? But it is also about the water quantity. How much water do I leave in the river, actually, uh, for, the, uh, for the environment and for the um, ecosystem to live from? And when we are then really implementing all these measures, hopefully, and have enough money to implement that, because that's, in most cases, the biggest obstacle, obviously, um, then we hopefully get to improved state, good chemical quality, good ecological quality status, and a healthy river habitats. It's not only about species, it's really about whole habitats. So the program of measures are the very central integrated part of uh, each river-based management plan. And uh, what we know from the first cycle, from the first river-based management plans and their assessments, and this is a citation from uh, the Commission's report, the program of measures lack information on the specific measures to be taken to achieve the environmental objectives. This is a concern not just for transparent transparency of the plans with regard to public interest and economic actors, but also towards the authorities uh, tasked to carry out the measures. What does it mean? On the one hand, the criticism was that the measures, the plans of measures weren't ambitious enough, that they weren't integrated enough, that they weren't discussed enough uh, with all the stakeholders. Um, that sounds very negative. I would like to bring a positive note here in as well, um, which was that between water directors and in that implementation community, we noticed that with this first river-based management plan, we had actually a huge kickoff of a kind of discussion and uh, a cooperation on river basin level, which I think was not seen before. And uh, I probably should have better put that on a slide, uh, because that probably is a message uh, we should, or that is the message uh, we should look at and uh, take as an encouraging uh, for the second cycle to really further improve uh, the cooperation 
and uh, the integration. Um, and saying that, um, that of course relates, as I said, the Water Framework Directive should be, could be an umbrella for other processes. It relates to the relationship between the water directives, the nature directives, and the flood directive as part of the uh, water authority realm as well. And uh, I think the important thing is the coordinated activities between the directives, uh, as all of them have plans of measures, flood management plans, nature management plans, in their implementation in one or the other end. Um, and I think the, the important question is uh, how we bring these management plans and these implementation processes uh, in a coordinated way uh, on the ground. And there are a lot of common issues between the Water Framework Directive, the Nature Directive, Flood Directive, which is um, the uh, uh, giving room for the river is just uh, uh, one thing. Um, uh, 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 the flood plain restoration, uh, natural water retention measures uh, are other elements uh, that are really very important uh, to mention here. So it's really about the future and uh, the second and third cycle. Uh, and as you see, it's public participation that throughout the cycle should keep that together. And uh, what we found out in, in the report, I, I would like to uh, draw your attention today to, uh, is really that the institutional setup should be transparent and clear and responsibility in all domains really need to fit together and need to be clear uh, to all stakeholders. What we need is a shared ownership between all these stakeholders, and I call here stakeholders, organized stakeholders, as well as the wider public, including also NGOs, including volunteers that are really have a responsibility at their rivers, as we have in the UK, the river trusts that are really very important people, persons. In the end, it all hangs on persons that really need to carry uh, the legislation through. Yeah? So this buy-in and willingness for implementation is, is absolutely vital um, to include all relevant stakeholders throughout uh, the different um, uh, industries throughout the different uh, activities, economic activities, um, and uh, of course use practical activities, use social media as well um, as the as advantage um, we have in modern times uh, to make that kind of communication. So as my last slide, uh, when we look again at that second river-based management plan, um, as I said, it's about the coordinated objectives, the coordination towards an ecosystem approach, uh, what can be delivered in the implementation of these three directives. Um, but it goes beyond the pure implementation of the directive. It's really about a policy process, a catch an on-catchment approach, and integrated management. Um, and uh, public participation really means working with the public and all stakeholders. And uh, I would like to see the 2015 winner of the European River Prize uh, to present us really the perfect and most wonderful and the river-based management plan that manages all that and integrates all our wishes for real, true environmental protection implementation of these directives. Thank you. Thank you.